Hello, in the name of Mutovila Institute. We are a non-governmental institute from Slovenia, and our main aim is promotion of transnational and cross-sectoral cooperation in the culture and creative sectors. We are also Creative Europe Desk, national contact point for EU Creative Europe program. We are a member of On the Move, Culture Action Europe, and Creative Europe Desk Network. In cooperation with partners and international experts, we are organizing a professional training series entitled Beyond the Culture Model. We offer new tools, skills, and knowledge for the Slovenian culture and creative sectors. On today's webinar, we will present four funding programs and the organizations behind them. The Visegrad Fund, the European Cultural Foundation, the Active Citizens Fund in Slovenia, and Cultura Nova Foundation from Croatia. The discussion will provide us insight into the process of creating tender mechanisms that we could better understand the stories behind and improve our ability to read calls for proposals. Enjoy the webinar, and if you want to know more about Mutovila, go to mutovila.si webpage. We will start with a short round of introductions. Our guests have received a um, few pointers to around which we, we ask them to build their presentation. And then we will have three clusters of discussions. After each one, we will open the floor for questions. Uh, the first round will be on the already mentioned strategic level. Uh, the second round, we will try to see what the um, um, pandemic and um, um, the situation, that uh, the changing situation, how will it influence um, the strategies of funders, what uh, potential changes in practices there will be, uh, maybe some even uh, ideological, on the ideological level. And uh, this, the last round will be dedicated to a more uh, practical perspective. Uh, so we will try to look at uh, some points of uh, the applications and gain uh, insight from the other side, what maybe are the most uh, um, common misunderstandings and most common um, like uh, wrong reading of the instructions and expectations of the funders um, in these fields. Um, okay, so uh, let's start with the introduction round. I would uh, first like to give word to Dea Vidovic, uh, who is uh, um, representing Cultura Nova Foundation. I would uh, just before that, I would like to um, tell the listeners that perhaps uh, there are uh, some of the funds that we are presenting today are not directly um interest uh, are not directly approachable for us coming from slovenia but uh, nevertheless they are uh, and i'm sure we will hear today or we will make sure that you understand why we are presenting them and why they're relevant also for slovenian context um so uh, Dea Vidović, uh, before taking over the position of the first manager of the Cultura Nova Foundation, uh, she, uh, worked as an editor, journalist and leader of numerous cultural projects, mainly in civil society organizations in the field of contemporary art and culture. She has also collaborated with the Student Center of the University of Zagreb, the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Croatia, the European Cultural Foundation and many other domestic and international institutions and organizations. She has participated in numerous conferences and is the author of a large number of articles on new cultural practices and editor of several publications. Uh, so Dea, I would kindly ask you to um, give us an introduction to your organization and um, foundation, uh, funds and your work. Um. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Urshka, uh, for this uh, short introduction and uh, definitely for the invitation and the opportunity to spend uh, this uh, Monday morning uh, with you and sharing some information about Cultura Nova. Uh, even as you said, it's not dedicated directly to uh, Slovenia cultural operators, but somehow it could be also uh, useful uh, for uh, some of them at least, uh, uh, especially the one who work in civil society organizations. Since uh, we plan to start with a really short presentation, I didn't prepare anything in a sense of slides. Uh, I will just uh, talk and share uh, just the intro uh, of uh, uh, Cultura Nova Foundation. The very interesting uh, uh, 
thing is that the, the name of Cultura Nova uh, uh, Foundation inspired by a capacity building, building program established by uh, and implemented by uh, European Cultural Foundation uh, with their partners uh, on the beginning of 21st century. Uh, so we used and inspired by the name of this uh, education program which were was dedicated to civil society organization meaning non-profit non-governmental associations uh, in the western balkan uh, 20 years ago uh, cultura nova as a foundation is a result of a bottom up uh, initiative led by non-profit, non-governmental uh, uh, associations in, uh, which work in very specific field of contemporary arts and culture. And after uh, several years of this advocacy process, it results with establishment of Cultura Nova Foundation uh, by Republic of Croatia. So it means that uh, Cultura Nova is a public foundation established based on the specific law on Cultura Nova Foundation adopted by the Croatian Parliament in 2011. In this uh, um, law on Cultura Nova, the, the main mission, the purpose of uh, Cultura Nova defined, and it's to support professional and uh, providing professional and financial support uh, to NGOs uh, in contemporary arts and culture. We started, uh, we, we, I, I like to say that we are still a pretty young uh, institution, a public foundation. We started to operate in 2012, and we basically develop uh, two, um, two pillars of uh, uh, how we operate. One is our grant program, and another one is uh, uh, our operational activities in the field of research and development. But basically 80% of the total budget of Cultura Nova is dedicated to our grants program through which we support uh, uh, NGOs in contemporary arts and culture. In last uh, almost nine years uh, of being active, uh, we developed uh, uh, eight uh, different areas, uh, different grants program uh, for supporting uh, um, civil society organization. Uh, trying to find a way how we can, as an institutions, be complementary to already existing uh, uh, bodies on the national, subnational, or international level. It means that we provide basically institutional grant support, uh, meaning that we are asking for the programs, but basically we uh, provide the grants for the operational cost of our beneficiaries. We also support uh, uh, the conceptual and the preparation uh, phase of any new programs and projects, which usually um, no one support. So we basically want to support as well as artistic research uh, to, to create the condition for our beneficiary to, you know, to stop a little bit, to test, to experiment, to research, to think about their next step, which is usually in this uh, uh, paradigm of uh, uh, projectitis, how we call it, uh, it's basically not possible because we run from one project to another. Um, we also uh, provide the support uh, for establishment and development of cooperation platform uh, for the program exchange, uh, but also for the advocacy activities on the subnational level. Uh, of course, for the creation NGOs, but we also provide through one of our grants program uh, support for a cooperation platform in Europe. It means that also organizations from Slovenia can be uh, members of this kind of the cooperation platform which we support, but of course the leader partner should be uh, from Croatia. We also provided uh, support for the audience development and uh, for organizational and uh, artistic uh, uh, memory. And the aspect of participation and engagement in arts and culture, basically cultural democracy, is one of a uh, very important topic for us. And just to, to conclude with this intro part uh, and in 
presenting of Cultura Nova, as I said, we, uh, beside our grants uh, uh, program, we also work as an operational foundation through our R&D department, uh, through which we develop our educational activities, uh, which is uh, also a reaction of the fact that uh, in Croatia, in Croatia um, we, we faced the, the really serious lack of uh, uh, any um, cultural management, cultural policy program in a public uh, uh, educational sector. So um, majority of our beneficiaries uh, basically educated uh, through learning by doing process. So we started to provide a different kind of the trainings, uh, workshops, uh, conferences through which we also build their capacity. We also conduct a research and we work as a policy uh, making uh, in the, the policy making area we take the responsibility of being a public bodies and we know that uh, for us it's um, much more easier to open some of the doors using of course the data which we gather and collected conducted uh, uh, through different research and then used, as I said, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, advocacy process, trying to change, to influence the cultural policy framework in order to improve uh, uh, for the condition, better creation of the better condition for the ben beneficiaries, which, is, uh, uh, which are our main purposes uh, of uh, existing, uh, existence as a foundation. Here, I, I, I will stop. I think that it's uh, enough for an intro of what, uh, what is our purpose and the mission. And then through other questions, other part uh, of the session, we can go uh, deeper and further. Excellent. Thank you for this overview. Um, I will now give, uh, give the space to Veronica Wodland, um, who Second, who is coming from Tsenova uh, Os. Um, uh, Tsenova Os is a center for non-government uh, organizations in Slovenia and they are responsible for managing Active Citizens Fund in Slovenia. Uh, we can read on Tsenova Os webpage that Veronika is an inexhaustible source of information about the non-government sector, which is why in the office you often hear we will ask Veron uh, Veronika, she knows it. At the same time, she's one of the greatest project experts in our country. In her many years of work, she has successfully applied and then led over hundreds of domestic, European and American projects. So for sure, she will also be a very valuable asset to our to, uh, conversation today. So please, Veronika, um, I ask you for an uh, introduction of um, the fund. Okay, uh, well, then, thank you for this introduction. Yes, I've been working in the sector for a very long time, apparently. Well, um, so, uh, but I will not talk about the other stuff today. I will just focus on the Active Citizens Fund, which I hope that um, at least some of you already know what it's all about. But for the rest, it's um, what it used to be, well, what, what is still known in, in Slovenia in, uh, in our common language as the Norwegian funds, although they were never just Norwegian, but this is something that, you know, kind of catch up in, uh, in the NGO sector. With this new period, they had um, formed a special fund called Active Citizens Fund to make sure to have it more um, recognized and also to, to divide it from, from the other parts of their um, donation scheme. So we as CNVOS, together with two partners, are the fund operators for um, Active Citizens Fund in Slovenia. Um, there is a main focus of the fund is to strengthen civil society and promote active citizens, citizenship and empower vulnerable groups. Um, but in the, in, in the overall, also our goal as CMVOS um, is to try to get um, to, to secure funding for the areas that in Slovenia usually don't get funding. So that was our main um, main focus when we were drafting um, uh, the scheme, drafting how our co that the calls will work and also trying to figure out which are the results that we then can um, provide to the donors. 
um, our, our main focus was basically um, to, to try to, to get funds for the areas and for, um, for organizations, for topics that are most of the time kind of left out. Of course, still keeping in mind this broader scheme of the donors. So Active Citizens Fund is being supported by three countries. Um, that's um, Norway, uh, Liechtenstein and Iceland. Um, uh, and um, we, in in the total, we have about three million um, of um, euros that we will um, give to to NGOs. Um, it's a bit less. It's um, but yes, we're somewhere around there. Um, and we will do that through four calls. Um, one was already finished. That's the call for uh, large and, and medium projects. Right now, we have this current one, which is for micro projects for fast response. I will talk about it a bit later. And we will also have institutional support grant, which will be probably published or by the end of the July or in September, but we'll see how it will work. And uh, we will then also have small grants. Um, the main difference between one and the other is um, just the size of the grants with um, two, two specialities. One is this fast response fund or ad hoc grants, and the other one is institutional support. So um, I will tell you more about fast response because it's a call that it's currently open and because it's um, also a bit special, something unusual that we don't usually have. Um, this is actually the fund, it's um, not for big projects, but it's just something that enables NGOs to give a fast response to something that is currently going, going on. Um, so, for example, it could be something um, for um, some organization may apply with a project to fund some of the parts that are needed for the protest. It could be for the protest of the culture organizations and, and artists, or it could be, you know, the general protest, or some organizations could apply with them um, um, because the government did something or didn't do something and they need to to organize themselves and they need to prepare an um, advocacy action or a campaign or a petition or whatever things like that that could be supported. One of the pillars is also um, the reaction to the whole pandemia situation. So this is also something that could be funded if this is um, really something that needs to be done urgently. So it's a bit, um, um, it's a bit strange because we didn't have any any call like that in the past, and now it's a bit confusion between um, the normal projects and these ad hoc grants. Um, but I think that with the with the practice and with some examples, when we get um, the first uh, project selected, I think that the people will also understand better what we are aiming for in this um, in this area. So the um the program has been a bit adopted due to due to pandem pandemia it wasn't a big change but we will um well it wasn't a big change on the program level for the for the project um for the program but i think it's going to make a big uh, impact on the projects on the beneficiaries because um in the in the past uh, we were not able to um, to give full grants, it was also about uh, it was always about co-financing from the beneficiaries. Due to the pandemic, now we will have most of the projects will be 100% co-financed by the uh, by the fund, by Active Citizens Fund. So I think this is a big um, big um, help for for appliers. Um, and that that was you know the the biggest change on the program program level, but we will also add some specific topics on reactions to pandemia or the the adoption of the work or you know different situations that some vulnerable groups have become vulnerable because of pandemia and stuff like that. So there will be some um, some um, changes on the content as well. But as in general, the program was very and is very broad already. It includes, we, we never excluded and it wasn't um, never a very 
strict list of who the vulnerable people are and mm -hmm. in what uh, situations they have to be and stuff like that. So we were very open from the beginning um, and we will definitely remain to be very open. Um, and that means that a lot of these changes don't have to happen like formally, but you know, in the, in, in the sense that if this is going to be a topic, then of course they can address it with their, with their, um, grants, okay. um, with their we proposals. Will, we will also return to the, to the context and impact of the, uh, COVID, uh, in a bit later. Uh, but you gave us uh, some starting points that maybe we can start building on when we come to there. Uh, so um, thank you for um, this thank introduction. You. I would now like to uh, give word to Michal. Uh, Michal Pavlik is uh, representing Visegrad uh, Fund um, and uh, in, uh, his station in Slovakia. Um, I do not see him. With us, yes. Okay. Um, so Michal Pavlik is a public relations manager at International Visegrad Fund. He has joined the fund in 2014 and is uh, responsible for sharing the fund's vision. Uh, vision uh, that the grant scholarship and residences will become the catalyst of the advent advancement of innovative ideas in Central and Eastern Europe with the potential partners and uh, organizations who uh, approach them and um, building through these partnerships in transforming the vision, uh, mm -hmm. the vision they, they, they outlined into a new reality. Um, so I invite Michal to um, give us a short introduction to their work. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you for the invitation, first of all. Um, this is a very nice opportunity to present the Visegrad Fund also outside of the region that we are mostly active in, which is, um, as you can imagine, the Visegrad Group uh, region or Visegrad Group countries. Uh, um, we have had some collaborations with um, organizations from Slovenia, so I'm very happy to maybe uh, invite some other organizations to apply for our grants. So a little bit of the Visegrad Fund, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't know. We were established 20 years ago um, as an um, uh, international organization by four governments, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland. Uh, it was exactly nine years after the Visegrad Group uh, was established as a regional cooperation platform for the countries uh, in this region uh, before uh, joining the European Union. Uh, the idea was to uh, support the Visegrad cooperation on a non-governmental level by giving grants, to projects and uh, scholarships for uh, mobility within the region for scholars, for researchers, for artists, for artist residencies. And these are the uh, main uh, tools that the Visegrad Fund is using to support and promote uh, exchanges and regional cooperation in the region. The key principle of our operation is that we give governmental funds. Every uh, of the four countries uh, contributes 2 million euros a year uh, to the Visegrad Fund, so altogether we distribute some 8 million euros uh, a year to non-governmental organizations, um, uh, mostly but not uh, exclusively. Uh, we also support public bodies, municipalities, some local governments, regional governments, but also private citizens. Uh, we are. We always say that we are searching for some added value for the region, which is not <laughs> defined. Uh, and the, we asked actually the applicants to tell us what they think will be the added value for the region, what they think is uh, what should be addressed uh, and can be addressed in the best way through regional uh, approaches. Um, we have seven focus areas. Mm, there is culture as well, as we are now talking about cultural uh, grants. Uh, and actually it constitutes some 30% uh, or even more than 30% of all of our grants. Uh, but other than that, we also support education, we support environmental protection, we support uh, media and democracy values in the region. Um, and we also try to promote these values outside of the V4, especially in the neighboring regions and the resistant partnership countries and Western Balkan countries. Uh, in order to receive the support from Visegrad Fund, we have one condition and that is that your project must involve cooperation with at least 
three uh, entities from three Visegrad countries. Um, that mean, means that you as an applicant uh, from Slovenia would have to find partners from, uh, let's say, Slovakia, Czech Republic and Hungary. Um, we also have some contributions from external partners. Uh, we have had some support from the Netherlands, from the government of Canada, from Germany and so on. Uh, we take pride in this because it kind of shows the credibility of our organization and that we are able to uh, contribute to maybe more wider goals of the European community in the regions of the Western Partnership of Western Balkan countries. Visegrad Fund is a very small organization. We only have 12 uh, employees and we are based in Bratislava, as well said, and uh, we have a rotating management every three years that are directed changes and we have employees from all four countries at the moment. Um, and what can I say? Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know if I should go into details regarding the, uh, the grant programs. We have three grant programs which are uh, open for applications three times a year. 1st of February, 1st of June and 1st of October are the deadlines for applications. And as I said, uh, the applications are uh, on demand driven, let's put it this way. We don't um, issue calls for applications with specific um, goals or aims that would be changing according to the situation. We ask the applicants to tell us what they see as problems in their areas, in their communities, and also to propose a solution that we could uh, help them to achieve with our grants. And our grants can cover up to 100% of the budget of the project. We don't ask for co-financing, although we welcome that, as it also shows that the project might have higher, um, I mean, higher support or bigger support from other, uh, other stakeholders. Maybe that would be from my side about the Visegrad Fund at the beginning and uh, I will talk a bit more later about okay. Gito. Thank you. Uh, thank you for um, this introduction. Uh, we uh, will now give a space to Philip Dittmeyer. Uh, he is representing European Cultural Foundation. Uh, we ask him to uh, focus on Culture of Solidarity Fund. Um, but first, to introduce our last guest, um, Philip Dittmeyer has been working in the field of European cultural relations for more than 15 years. He is head of uh, programs at the European Cultural Foundation in Amsterdam. Uh, amongst other, he has co-creating the tandem cross-border collaboration programs for cultural workers and community activities community activists from Central Eastern Europe and the EU neighboring countries. Uh, so um, I believe that uh, he is very familiar also with our context. Um, uh, the European Cultural Foundation is an independent foundation, uh, but I'm sure that uh, Philip will um, talk more about it and present the organization also in relation to the fund. Um, so please, Philip. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, indeed, I'm very connected to the region, among other, because I'm originally from uh, Austria, but based in Amsterdam for a long time already. And uh, um, I'm also connected to what they said in the beginning, because uh, believe it or not, Cultura Nova, as a very young project manager, was my first program I did for the European Cultural Foundation <laughs> in the um, early millennium years, actually, or late 90s it started, but I wasn't there from the beginning. Um, anyway, a few words about the European Cultural Foundation to give you the, the, the whole picture. I think it's also important uh, to say right at the beginning that we are not the European Union and that we have nothing to do with uh, Creative Europe or any of the European funding uh, streams that are out there, but we are an independent foundation that is uh, financed from lotteries, uh, was initially founded in uh, Switzerland, in Geneva, uh, more than 65 years ago in 1954 and uh, Robert Schumann, the founder of the European Union and other pro-Europeans were among our uh, founders. The reason why I mentioned that is because it's very, very central to everything what we do and what we do this year uh, in, in, in relation to uh, Corona also because our founding fathers established the foundation with the idea that next to 
bringing Europeans together with coal and steel and economy, uh, it would not work if there wouldn't be a strong um, idea of bringing people together across borders through culture and as humans and with their ideas and their uh, visions about what the future uh, could bring. So this going cross-border and uh, bring people uh, from all over Europe together across borders is like very, very central to our 60, more than 60 years of, of, uh, of history. Um, I always mention now also that um, spirit is maybe most encapsulated in one of our most uh, well-known programs we developed or invented together with the European Commission in the 80s, which is the Erasmus uh, Students Exchange which we started uh, in the 80s and also implemented for a long time. And it also indicates that all our programs are still in the spirit of this uh, Erasmus Students Exchange in terms of being genuinely a cultural program, but not f uh, limited to arts or arts and culture only. And also because it very nicely shows how we have been traditionally, as Thea also has mentioned, been an, an idea giver to uh, policy uh, makers or to big European institutions, like in the context of the Erasmus uh, program. Uh, of course, you can imagine that everything that uh, we do or have been doing in the past uh, 15, 20, uh, five years, three years, two years, one year has come across borders is like very, very much influenced by, by, by uh, the pandemic now. Uh, all our programs, uh, especially the one that uh, you mentioned already, Ushka uh, Tandem, all our cultural mobility uh, programs have uh, completely uh, stopped uh, now, obviously. And because we are such uh, central, uh, or like actually the only uh, pan-European foundation that deals with, with, with culture, there is no other player than we are working across uh, our borders. Uh, this whole closing borders, thinking national, finding national solutions, uh, European institutions in the beginning being very absent, of course, touches very much upon the core of why we are there. So it's on one hand uh, a very good time for us because it shows very much why we are needed. But of course, it's also a terrible time because all the things we stand for are like very difficult. And this is why we decided at the beginning of the, or like in February, uh, when we were just about to roll out a whole new uh, five years strategy in a new, new work plan uh, to stop everything and to look into everything and to re-channel everything in this culture of solidarity fund you were mentioning. So practically everything uh, what we do this year is, is, is working under this culture of solidarity umbrella. The fund is only one element of it. It's a big element, but our other... Uh, uh, still ongoing uh, programs that we that that continued, of course, partially from from what was before Corona, all fall under this umbrella of uh, culture of solidarity now because we believe uh, um, our founding fathers always spoke about uh, um, uh, how we can develop through culture a, fe a, a joint feeling of belonging to Europe. They called it a, a sentiment. Uh, how we can be. Um, you know, like uh, Croatians, Slovenians, Austrians, uh, Slovaks, uh, and Europeans uh, uh, at the same time to develop this sentiment. And now we can see that, of course, without this uh, sentiment of feeling uh, how we are together in this as Europeans, we cannot uh, develop uh, or express or act in solidarity. And if we we don't do this, then I think the future of Europe will be a very bleak one. So this is what uh, the culture of solidarity fund is uh, mostly uh, there for, this uh, challenged uh, culture of European solidarity. Um, but if we are a very small foundation and at the same time, uh, of course, you all mentioned already, there are huge needs for those cultural actors who work on this, uh, uh, on this uh, uh, culture of solidarity to survive. And this is uh, pretty much at the heart of the fund and what it exactly uh, does or what uh, we have actually only three days ago uh, selected and in the first round with the second uh, uh, deadline opening in a week from now, uh, we can discuss later. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we see, I mean, I, there are some points that already I would like to address, um, maybe put them in, in dialogue or maybe see if there are some connections between these points. 
Uh, and as I said, uh, maybe first we will take a step back from the practicalities and talk about uh, the, the backstage of uh, your work that we usually don't see. Uh, so as I, uh, we already wrote in the like announcement of the event, Sometimes we as the applicants feel like we're not understood when we are trying to figure where to put and how to present everything we want to tell you about our work and our ideas. And I would like to start first from uh, with the other perspective. Uh, how does the process of your translation, of your mission, um, and what you want to achieve, and how you want to help us translate into into the calls, and um, as what from what uh, I heard from your um, from your presentations, maybe I would like to to uh, you to also address uh, like you mentioned like filling the gaps. Uh, funding something that uh, applicants don't have the opportunities to fund from other sources. Uh, that was mentioned a few times and maybe also to reflect a bit on the differences that come from the fact that some of the funds that we, are, uh, we have uh, presented today are uh, public and some are private because I'm sure that this also influences in a way on your work and your approach to uh, communicating with the cultural sector. Um, so I don't know, um, would anyone like to start or maybe we just... Yeah. Maybe I can start mm -hmm. if, if it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, thank you for this, um, another question which uh, uh, provide us opportunity to go deeper in a way how we operate. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are talking about Cultura Nova, one of the uh, important fact uh, is that uh, I personally, as a first director of Cultura Nova Foundation, but also the members of the first board of the directors um, of Cultura Nova Foundation, uh, uh, were people who work for years in the civil sector. So basically, when we start to build the Cultura Nova as a new institution, we already um, uh, were well known, you know, uh, informed by the needs mm -hmm. of the of the civil sector. Another fact uh, uh, was that we spent the years in this uh, advocacy process, as I mentioned, and through all that process, uh, uh, we took and analyzes what uh, uh, the needs of of this specific sector uh, were. You know, it's a different aspect. Um, and this uh, participatory approach, uh, uh, we continue to implement it during uh, the whole, you know, period of uh, building a Cultura Nova Institute, Cultura Nova is a new institution. So we organized uh, uh, a plenty of uh, exchange uh, between uh, Cultura Nova and our beneficiaries, or potential beneficiaries, and we are the institutions which uh, 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 which is always ready to change and to adopt in order to improve uh, the way how we support uh, our beneficiaries because that's the reason of our existence. You know, and uh, what we did from the beginning, uh, we focus uh, in a few years, almost first five years, uh, basically only to our grants program. Uh, so it means that we didn't want to develop institutions to exist uh, just uh, for itself you know, just the institutions for the institutions. So we completely focus on our program. And as I said, 80% still of the total budget of uh, uh, our institutions is dedicated to a uh, grants program. Uh, because uh, if, we, if the grants program doesn't exist, uh, we don't see the reason why Cultura Nova will exist. So our R&D department is like added value. You know, it's something what we decided to build as to being, you know, um, much more progressive institutions, the institutions uh, which is able to anticipate the future. 
and to try, you know, to, uh, to, to, to play, as I said, as a very progressive institutions, public institutions in the frame of uh, uh, Croatia as a transition country as a country of the new democracy which faced a, a, a lot of uh, a deficit uh, uh, in democracy uh, and uh, and the other problem of the democratic standards and the democratic institutions and so on we also everything what we build and what we developed uh, uh, we do very in a very transparent way we involved uh, um, experts uh, in different fields uh, to participate in decision-making process about the financing. So I, as a director and the board uh, of directors, uh, are not the one who decided about that. Even at the end, the board board of directors is the one who make the final decision, but it's a, like a decision through which they approve the decision of the experts, you know. And as I said, we are, uh, we developed this very interactive and dynamic relations with our uh, beneficiaries. Just uh, one uh, example, our interest in a cultural democracy, and especially in the participatory governance, basically inspired uh, by the beneficiaries, and it was our reaction to their demands. They, a few years ago, they came to us and said, uh, can you provide us uh, another kind of the support beside the financial support for our practices of the participatory governance? And that was the reason why we said, okay, let's develop our own specific project dedicated to this issue of participatory governance, because we also recognize that uh, the, the majority of the advocacy platforms, which we support on the subnational level, developed all around the Croatia, uh, were dedicated dedicated to this, uh, um, how we call it, new generation of the cultural center, which based on the participatory governance model, uh, civil public uh, partnership, which used by different uh, uh, users and the using the public infrastructure, build, as I said, a, a, a partnership with the public sector, which are basically the local authority are the owners of all that uh, public infrastructure. And we said, okay, we we can help you uh, through you know through other activities which we as institutions uh, um, uh, have more resources to do and to provide some kind of the general support for everyone, not for one uh, specific and also to try to influence and to change the cultural policy framework in order to provide uh, uh, sustainable support for this kind of the practices we will not be uh, or which can become a standard in the whole uh, uh, in the whole system so this is a, as a said a way how we uh, we try basically not to be only complementary to other institutions and other providers of uh, financial support or any other kind of support and also everything what we do we try to do in a complementary way we look how we can intervene among all our activities is in order to provide a stable and a better condition for our, our beneficiaries. So I hope it's a clear a little bit the uh, way how we, we are doing things. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. I think Philip has unmuted. <laughs> yes. you, you always see me when I have to, <laughs> to touch my screen when I'm unmuting myself. <laughs> um, Many, we could talk about many different aspects but um, uh, in, in, in relation to your question, but um, as we also specifically should give our listeners or viewers an, an idea, and it would be, that's, that's why I'm grateful for this opportunity also, because we start the next uh, round of the Culture of Solidarity Fund next week. And I think it's a good opportunity to uh, make potential applicants a little bit uh, better understand what we really uh, um, uh, uh, looking for, I would be 
mm-hmm. stand for because uh, that's why I started also with, uh, with, with saying that we are not the European Union. We are, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, we are lottery financed. In the Netherlands, there's a big uh, uh, lottery system that uh, funds a lot of uh, uh, cultural institutions and programs and foundations in the Netherlands. We are a very small player. Um, and that's why uh, the Culture of Solidarity Fund is also like very focused. Um, and it's really what we, re- we received a lot in the first round, uh, applications that are actually maybe meant or maybe even were uh, submitted once to Creative Europe, to Erasmus+, Plus, to Active Citizenship, to all these European programs. And this is what we are not, because we have the European Union there already, and uh, they are also now. Um, we are also, of course, uh, because we are connected to the field um, uh, already uh, for many decades, kind of like also an idea giver and in touch with the institutions to influence their thinking together with networks such as uh, Culture Action Europe. They are also in their policy making. There is something in, in, in preparation also, but our fund is really very much focusing on this culture of solidarity. So somebody just asked here, we received 2,500 applications or more than 2,500 okay. applications. And then you have to imagine we spent uh, uh, last week uh, the equivalent of what the city of Berlin uh, spent in, I don't know if you heard about the emergency measures for freelancers in Berlin. It's the equivalent of 80 artists, what we have spent last week. So it's really very small. We are very small funds. So that's why we have to be very focused. Um, so the more you are uh, kind of like carefully reading, understanding, interpreting the six points we have there, what we understand or what we open as kind of like fulfilling what could be uh, contributing to a culture of solidarity in Europe, uh, the more in in, in this uh, situation and for the future, the more likely uh, you are um, in in a a position to make it in in, in one of the selection rounds. There's still fierce competition. We receive many good ideas. Uh, but many of the ideas we have received are actually where we say, you know, like, but okay, there's going to be at some point a Creative Europe call, an Active Citizenship call, an Erasmus Plus call where these projects fit, fit much better. And for a culture of solidarity, it's not just, you know, like doing a project uh, that was going on anyway with six or seven countries. Uh, um, but it's really about this larger idea or this added not even the added value, it's really uh, about initiatives that really deal with this, uh, what's going on now, uh, where is this solidarity among us Europeans from a cultural angle uh, going to be, where is it now, where is it going to be in summer, where is it going to be in a year from now, in 10 years from now. But it's, just to reiterate again, it's, uh, it, we are a very small fund and it's uh, unfortunately, uh, we are nowhere in uh, in a position to kind of like answer these uh, emergency funds that were made available by public funders in different countries. We have a specific focus on those countries, um, or like we look uh, more uh, in a more open way when we have receive applications where no such funding is available uh, uh, whatsoever. For example in, I don't know, Kosovo, or maybe also an important uh, point to, 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 to mention here, we are not confined uh, to funding uh, in the European Union only, but really in the larger Europe, and theoretically you can apply from around the world uh, for the Culture of Solidarity Fund if you have something to say or to do or an idea about Culture of Solidarity uh, with the European aspect. But um, yeah, in the... There is the, the official um, list of selected projects is only, only going to be online next uh, week, I believe, because uh, those who were awarded have only received their letters on Friday and now have to confirm. Uh, but there is not much from Germany, for example, or from other places where um, uh, you know, a lot of public funding has become available uh, now already. Maybe because that's also part of the discussion discussion uh, uh, you indicated we're going to have later on. I think that's a pretty interesting game changer now that indeed in some countries like Germany, uh, but also some in Central Europe, um, a lot of public funding has been made available already and probably not enough, but I mean, the willingness is there to make uh, public funding available for uh, saving uh, cultural institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, probably just 
Um, Veronica, would you like to? Yeah, <laughs> I was just uh, trying to see if anybody else has already unmuted. So I can give you a bit of uh, information how the whole process looks in our from from our side. At one point, we we are very happy that we are not just the fund operator for the ACF, but we are also the national NGO network. So we kind of um, constantly monitor the calls that are available for the NGOs, the areas that are covered and stuff like that. So it means that in the beginning we did have um, a bit more information than it, let's say other other organization, organizations who had applied um, to become the fund operator. But even that from the beginning that we were selected as a, as a fund operator and in the period before our framework from the program was finished, it took almost a year, a year of consultations with beneficiaries, with um, NGOs, with stakeholders in Slovenia, but in, in the same um, time also um, negotiations and uh, consultations with the donor countries, with representatives of the donors, because they also have their own agenda on what they want to do and how they want to do it. And based on that, we had developed a results framework, which means that for, for the fund in Slovenia, we already had quite um, clearly identified um, some, some results and indicators that we want to achieve during the whole program. It doesn't mean that each of the projects has to achieve those things, but you know, as a program um, at the end, we will have to report on that. And um, so that was basically our framework and it was done in consultations with, uh, with the beneficiaries. We had some live events, we had some online consultations, all in, in, in with a view to, to get the best support to the NGOs that they needed and to really identify the, the, the stuff that should be um, should be supported. Um, we also figure out that with the applications that we did receive, that a lot of um, projects were uh, more suitable for other funders maybe, that you know you could see that this is just some, uh, some of the activities that the organizations are doing already and that they have support for for implementations of those um, of those projects. So, but what we were trying to do, just because we are trying, we, we really are trying to support the things that cannot be supported in other in other ways or by by other um, institutions. We were trying to find different projects, other projects, not just whatever organization is already doing, but you know, try to figure out, okay, how can we do some things better? Um, and if you would look at the the whole documentations, we had actually put there all of our results that we had in the results framework. We said, we also put the explanation of what that means, what we are searching for, and how organizations can actually supply that. It doesn't mean, as I said, that each organization or each project should address all of these, but you know, you have to pick at least one to make, to make sure that, that, um, that contribute to the whole into, picture <laughs> into our framework. Yeah, I will give you an example. One of the indicators is the number of NGOs who are using advocacy based, um, uh, evidence based advocacy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the only thing that the only thing that organization needed to do is just to explain to us how they will build on their capacities to use the advocacy based, um, the evidence based advocacy in their advocacy actions. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be one, one of the topics. And then it could be on regardless of the, pro, uh, of the topic, whatever it would be, it would fit into the program. So it, you just had to rethink about how you're doing things and then do it in this, um, in this way. And it kind of fit it um, into the framework. But yeah, it was, it was a process. Even in, even the whole programming period, it was quite a, um, quite long process and it was involving all the key stakeholders, absolutely, including the fisheries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a, uh, as we see, it's always like there's a, a, a process behind it that uh, we are faced only with the final result, actually. And uh, it's also on our side to, to have to read uh, and see what the process behind was. Uh, Michal, you already mentioned when you were presenting that your fund was established as a, like a, an, a, an added level to um, um, exchange between uh, Visegrad countries. 
so this is one of the things that uh, were behind developing the program, but I'm sure you have some other um, elements you'd like to share with us. <laughs> Thank you, Ushka. Uh, yeah, now for the public uh, donor, as we are, um, as you can imagine, the decision-making process is a little bit more complicated and uh, it maybe happens on more levels of decision-making. Um, how we check that fund that there is a conference of uh, ambassadors, as we call it, which are ambassadors um, to the country which is um, presiding in the Visegrad group uh, every year, which actually formally approves the project that we as a fund recommend for support. And about that, there is a conference of ministers <laughs> which uh, formally signs these projects. Uh, so the process is uh, multi-layered and also as uh, we discussed the consequences of the COVID pandemic in Europe and how um, organizations that fund projects respond to it. Um, if, uh, if I should speak for the Visegrad Fund, we as a funder decided to target uh, projects which are in the need of uh, um, development of uh, ideas, how to tackle the consequences uh, in Visegrad region. And we were communicating this during the last COPRA applications, which was February 1st. Um, we have received uh, for this call over 460 applications. We are at the moment uh, evaluating them and uh, at the end of summer we will know which will be supported. And at the moment I cannot say how many of them are responding, uh, responding to the situation, uh, the pandemic situation, and how many of them are from the cultural um, area. Uh, but in general, as I said before, uh, we are asking the, uh, the grantees to tell us what they think is the uh, uh, problem that they would like to address. We don't so much uh, give a guidance as a funder what we want to support, uh, unless there is a requirement from some of the contributors, from um, external uh, partners, uh, which I mentioned before, such as the government of the Netherlands, uh, for example. Um, what can I add to this, <laughs> how it works. Well, we have uh, criteria which is published on the website. We uh, have um, had many uh, recommendations from other founders that operate in, that, in our region, which sent their grantees to us because they believe that uh, uh, their ideas are more suitable for uh, us as a founder because we think of our grants as a seed money uh, very often. We give not so um, big amounts at the beginning uh, to develop your idea, to maybe just test it, maybe to meet with some other uh, more experienced organizations from other countries so that you can uh, build uh, and mm -hmm. somehow improve uh, capacity of your organization in some way. And then you can apply for bigger grants from maybe European um, Mm -hmm. funds such as Horizon in the area of research uh, and science development and for that yes Creative Europe very often we get these applications because of course it's uh, also much less complicated and we don't require as many uh, organizations to be involved in the project from all uh, corners of Europe um, but I would say that it's very uh, good for uh, organization which would like to uh, have a big European project to start maybe on a regional level and involve uh, organizations from the neighboring countries uh, to test their idea and to uh, find maybe suitable partners which is because it's also sometimes not that easy uh, to find a partner which is on the same uh, you know wave <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> Uh, okay, yes. Um, I, I would like to come back to this a bit later because uh, one of the practicalities I wanted to talk about are also partnerships and managing partnerships, which can be quite challenging. But uh, on the for this first strategic level, I would just like to have one more question before we move on. Um, I mean, in our organization, a few years back, we sat down and we kind of clearly outlined the directions and what are the pillars of our work, uh, which helped us a lot in uh, structuring also, okay, and actually saying it out loud and writing it down that we will not be inventing projects just because there's a call out there. Um, and also Boyan last week mentioned the bending of the activities just to somehow feed, feed them into the, into the 
uh, call that is out. And both uh, yeah, Philip and Veronica, you mentioned that for this uh, emergency funds, a lot of projects that you have feeling have already been submitted somewhere else came to you. So maybe I would just like to have a short round on your opinion on um, strategizing on how to say no to, to, to an opportunity. Because I think this is something that we often are, as uh, applicants, uh, very reluctant to do and to say, okay, this maybe is not an opportunity. And not thinking about the cost in, in form of our time and effort that maybe could be channeled uh, in, in somewhere, somewhere else and better. And I really wanted to address this um, as one of the first thinking process that I think organizations should take. Um, when uh, building their fundraising strategies in relation to applying to, for tenders. Shall I start? Please do. <laughs> it's, it's a very important and good, uh, good, good point. Um, and I mean, let me maybe first start with saying that I have a lot of understanding also when people recycle their project ideas. You know, this is maybe the unfortunate thing we have in the cultural sector and with this funding landscape that uh, if you work in the field, in order to make sure you uh, maintain the functioning of your organization mm -hmm. uh, with this project-driven uh, logic, you always need to have something in the drawer to, 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 to submit. Um, so, you know, and then I have even more understanding in this situation now. You know, we came for uh, reasons also the culture of solidarity fund as a message was equally as important, maybe even more important for the moment than as a fund. Like I said, you know, like we are very small in the first round. We managed to, uh, to, to give the equivalent of what Berlin gave to 80 artists. And they have, uh, I think they're paying out now to the second round of 50,000 artists already. So, you know, like it's, mm -hmm. it's more the, 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 the symbolic and the message that is out there. That's why I have a lot of understanding for those people who applied also now that they uh, have to come to terms themselves first and see what does this all mean for me. Uh, and um, the first deadline was on the 27th of April. So, you know, I think for the second round, maybe for the later rounds, maybe even for next year, if we continue to do it next year, I think the thinking will also uh, uh, evolve, but it's always, Useful, I think, to sit down uh, and yeah, not to jump for the for the first uh, funding opportunity as 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 uh, seducing as it might be, uh, but really to think down and 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 rather take a little bit more of a, of of a thought like what could really uh, fit into this than rather jumping uh, forward, and maybe very concretely here, you know, of course, um, um, I think. Tactically, if, if you're an applicant, of course, waiting for the second round, seeing first what, uh, what was interesting in the first round for a funder, and especially not going for the highest uh, uh, amount uh, uh, would, would be very advisable here. I mean, we have uh, three levels explicitly. We made like very small uh, um, grants of up to 5,000, up to 15 to 30,000, and 50,000. Um, and yeah, most applicants came for the kind of like middle range, but uh, of course we had many also who were just, you know, like going for the max of 50,000 without uh, uh, thinking much if that is actually just uh, tactically uh, 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 smart to do. So, but I, as I said, I have a lot of understanding for that recycling of project proposals, but, um, and, and it maybe eventually, uh, you know, even works, but uh, not, not everywhere. Uh, it's always better to sit down and 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 uh, recycling is also fine but maybe you know to uh, to, to to add something on top of what like really answers them to uh, mm -hmm. what's there in the guidelines okay would someone uh -huh, veronica yeah um i can i can just um continue with that basically what we had seen that and it of course didn't work was that it, when, whenever the organizations was just trying to um, apply with what they are already doing and then just for the f to, to make it 
seem like that it fits into the program. They just added a line with, okay, and we will also do some advocacy campaign or uh, some campaign, um, some uh, awareness raising campaign or something, but the whole project didn't make sense because it was not clear how they will be able to do that. So instead of um, putting the advocacy campaign or uh, um, uh, awareness raising campaign in the center, it was just some side effect of, I don't know, the, the classical social uh, service um, project that they will do as a major. And then mm -hmm. just because they have to, they will do that as well. Mm -hmm. And in this case, well, for, for us, it doesn't make sense. And for the applicants, I would say it, it, it would make sense, but only if you decide that this is another area where you want to be active. If you will start with advocacy and then finish with advocacy just for this project, then it makes no sense because it would make your life harder. Because in order to implement the project the way it should be, you will really have to work too hard for what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Because trying to become an expert in advocacy and provide some results in advocacy in, in a period of one project, it's it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but if you are, you, you, if for example, right now you are even a culture organization working in the field of culture, but you do want to expand to, to advocacy, to, to making sure that the voices of the people who are working in this area are more heard, then yes, then definitely that would make sense. But not just to get the money because at the end you will see that it's not worth it. Thank you. Can I yeah, please? Uh, can I add uh, a few things? Uh, basically, uh, my idea is not to uh, explain how we work in that area, but to go on a much more general uh, level and uh, provide some of the conclusion and the facts uh, uh, which we face. Uh, uh, not only these days, but uh, also before Corona mm -hmm. time. I think that the arts and cultural uh, sector um, are under a huge pressure, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, many uh, of the uh, organization, uh, artists, uh, uh, individuals, cultural workers uh, already, you know, experience this funding cut on different levels. Of course, uh, uh, some of them also increased their competition for the funds and the opportunities, but still I see, uh, especially based on what uh, already mentioned by my colleagues, uh, Philip and Veronica, uh, uh, I see uh, a lot of opportunities uh, for trainings in that area in the future but also you know uh, uh, we faced uh, uh, in, the, in the sector uh, plenty of challenges presented by the technology climate emergency reducing in arts education uh, of course changing trends in an engagement uh, participation uh, uh, and audiences as well so all of that basically created a huge pressure on the arts and demands from the cultural sector to uh, somehow, you know, uh, take the, the, the role of many other different sectors from the social services, health, and so on and so on. So the, the, the basically, I think uh, um, this uh, uh, vulnerable part, but also resilient part of the cultural sector uh, became much more visible in this corona uh, period, but also based on your question and the answer, uh, previous answer of my colleagues show us that uh, um, somehow uh, we, we can use you know this opportunity to make something different in the future so how we can basically because it's obviously we as an institution as a culture and our foundation uh, or any other uh, funds uh, created its own policy on the other side, we have uh, artists, uh, cultural workers, SMEs, uh, different kind of the NGOs, uh, public institutions uh, as well, private institutions and so on, with their own policies. But everything it's happened in the last 30 years, since the 90s, dominantly on a project-based which obviously, you know, created a plenty of uh, uh, challenges for the sector and it's not a way 
how we should continue to work. So the, the, the question, I don't have the answer, of course, but I really think that uh, this corona time um, has pushed us to take this momentum and to see how we can make us in a different way. You know, is it possible and not? And how we can how so, somehow, um, you know, defense from neoliberalization of the public policy or any other uh, uh, policy, you know, in order to, to make a systematic change on one side uh, uh, for the cultural sector, but also uh, in a general, of course, I I don't see uh, arts and culture as the main player in making this systematic change because it's uh, like, a, you know, another huge uh, instrumentalized pressure. But uh, definitely arts and culture are part of the total uh, system of globalization and internationalization, and we are not Tennyson's in that sense. So all of that show us that it's a time for, for serious, uh, serious change, which uh, I think uh, uh, we, we, we should develop together. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Michal, would you like to add something to this or? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe just that, uh, uh, yes, we also have many repeated applicants and repeated applications from the cultural sector. And we also see that there is a demand for uh, more sustainable, more long-term support uh, from the funders, especially to projects which are happening annually, and this is um, very common in the area of culture and arts. Mm -hmm. There are many festivals which take place on an annual basis, um, and this project-based funding, which, which we have seen in you know uh, in the last decades, has put uh, is putting limits on uh, the applicant uh, how to frame their project and. Uh, Mm, it's there's always the need to come up with something new to uh, yeah. attract the funder to uh, continue the support and it's very difficult in some cases we have uh, mm, consultations with our applicants and we always ask them to uh, try to expand uh, their ideas mm, to include more partners to go uh, maybe in to different geographic areas than uh, the ones that they are used to, mm, not to do the projects on the local level, but maybe uh, on a more and more regional level. And for that, we can also commit more and more uh, funds. So this is our response at the moment. We uh, try to start with a uh, little support and then increase it over the years as we see that the county uh, is responding to <laughs> these challenges that we give them. And uh, mm, for now, we don't have a strategy how to change this project-based uh, funding approach, but we see that there is a demand for uh, some different uh, uh, methods of support, definitely. Okay, thank you. Um, I would just like to remain, uh, uh, remind the participants and the, the listeners that uh, the Q&A section is open. If someone has any questions, some have already been answered on the way. Uh, as we have uh, spoken, I think, quite a lot on, on, on uh, COVID and the practical level and what came out of the first rounds of application, this new uh, contact and reality. I would just, because we, uh, we, I would really like also to have some time for the practical aspect. I would just ask if there are some like one to two sentence uh, strong points that you'd like to make in terms of um, what kind of ideological shifts you think might happen. Uh, some, some things were already mentioned that, um, that, uh, you know, that it's adapting, uh, for example, a, a culture of solidarity fund is adapting to the situation and building on this value of solidarity when, uh, when there's a process of limiting to the country, of uh, dissolving this um, trans-Europe um, exchange. But uh, if there is something else that uh, you would like to add to this, um, not so practical, but... Um, yeah, as I call it, ideological uh, level that might might uh, be seen in in a while after, uh, due to Corona um, epidemic. 
I, I can connect it to answering a question which was in the chat also. So like projects we supported, as I said, uh, they will be on the website next week or the week uh, after because applicants are now confirming. Mm -hmm. But maybe generally uh, said we received, all, and all of you mentioned it, we received a lot really applications now, you know, we do a festival and we want to do it online. Uh, we do a festival because there's also no time cap into what you can apply. We do a festival, we postpone it and want to do it next year. This will not have a chance to compete for the, um, among 2,500 for the, for the few we managed to, uh, to, 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 to support. Uh, so it's really about this. And like I said before, uh, it's not even about the added value or the exchange, but it's really maybe that's why it's connected to your question, Ushka. It's really to what will this, what we all experience now, to do to the cultural sector, to us as Europeans? Mm -hmm. uh, they already mentioned for Cultura Nova, it's very much about the cultural sector, which is, it's for us also about the cultural sector, but it's wider. The cultural sector as a as a field where we where we where we think and question and imagine uh, uh, how Europe will look like after this. Uh, so all the projects and then then the projects which are now among the selected ones uh, still do this uh, from a very specific uh, angle by dealing with particular topics that came up. Uh, specific communities, particularly marginalized communities, from seasonal workers to healthcare workers, all from a cultural or artistic angle, to particular communities. Many of the actually awarded uh, projects are from the countries. I think most of our viewers are, uh, are from who are, who are listening and, 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 and watching us here. Uh, so because, uh, like I said earlier already, we looked into where there is less funding available, where there's more like where, you know, some project idea can, can, can how to answer this situation can add to more uh, for making organizations uh, survive. Um, obviously, a lot from Italy also, uh, yeah. where this question of European solidarity with Italy uh, was very much perceived as a cultural question also, especially in relation to the uh, ideological discourse uh, in the Netherlands in terms of uh, the, the, the so-called frugal four and the, you know what uh, financial support uh, measures to come to terms uh, with the pandemic on a larger economic level all over Europe. Uh, uh, how how do, the, do the Netherlands position themselves in, 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 in that? Um, so there was also projects in there that uh, deal, for example, with the rights of artists and cultural workers uh, in the in the context of challenges uh, that came uh, uh, with, 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 with Corona. How can you protect artists and their rights and their, uh, uh, of cultural workers? So all the things that have a, a, a larger, uh, not only added value, but that really ad address the issues we face on a, on, a, on, 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 on a broader picture or towards the future. I think there will be more of that in the second round now, because obviously now it's a kind of like what we, uh, uh, the, the list uh, uh, we have selected now uh, shows a kind of like uh, as a total of a culture of solidarity in many different communities and many actual issues then came up in, 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 in communities and a combination of that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and maybe one word more to what uh, Dea said um, in terms of the, it could very well be that we are actually going through a shift uh, um, ideologically and when you see how the state has come back as an uh, as an actor in this uh, uh, measures that had to be taken uh, for the health crisis and as now uh, in the next weeks this 750 billion package uh, for economic recovery will be discussed maybe that's exactly the shift from what we have seen before where we always heard the market will answer it all well the market didn't answer anything in this corona crisis and uh will probably also not answer that much uh, uh in the future at least there's a lot of readiness of public uh, money to be spent on that and i think it's what would be interesting uh very interesting as uh ideas to receive uh, for the fund also how could the cultural sector or how can cultural initiatives and ideas and groups all over Europe maybe fill that 
new times with, with, with new ideas. It's, it's difficult, of course, to see because nobody knows what's going to happen after summer or <laughs> not to speak of next year or, 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 or in 10 years from now. But I think this is, for us at least, the role of the cultural sector also to, to explore, uh, to, to, to see what could be the future, to imagine the future. And uh, these are uh, from like very small to medium sized uh, projects, what we'd like to see uh, coming into the fund. Okay, thank you. Yeah, can I add uh, just a few things? Because uh, unfortunately, I have to leave you in a three minutes uh, mm -hmm. uh, to join another uh, session. Uh, so just uh, uh, to add uh, uh, and to shortly answer to your question, um, I'm, I'm pretty skeptic about uh, uh, the what what said that we are already in this paradigmatic shift because uh, government uh, uh, invest and implemented uh, uh, some new measures and uh, uh, budget uh, to support different areas and so on because we already experienced this uh, during the uh, last financial crisis that the government uh, you know helped the banks and all this uh, um, financial economic area to recover and uh, uh, to to become stronger and stronger you know so so this is the reason but also it's maybe because i'm coming from croatia originally from bosnia and herzegovina and i'm always skeptic you know about uh, any you know uh, uh, real kind of the of the of the shift so i i, I really believe that it's necessarily uh, that all of us involved and try to create this uh, uh, or imagine a better future, uh, how Philip said. And uh, um, answering to your question, talking about the ideological aspects, uh, I, I see it uh, as uh, uh, not only the sector, that the whole society based uh, on a much more equality uh, based on the green policy and also on different kind of the diversity, you know, uh, which uh, no of this verse will be the buzzwords than real implementation of the rhetoric and the narratives through the uh, concrete measures uh, created by different kind of the policy. And I see in this intersectorial and intervening between uh, um, all kind of the of the actors around Europe and on the globe scale is something what would make this kind of the changes. Uh, I will use also this uh, uh, opportunity to thank you one more for this uh, great uh, exchange among us and, and for the opportunity to be with uh, you on this uh, uh, Monday morning. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the uh, the other ones still with us um, because we are it's 11:30. This is the length that we announced. But if you have time, uh, I would ask you to maybe bear with us for another round because I feel like I'm uh, missing an opportunity to uh, open this practical level I mentioned. If if uh, I don't. Uh, I don't use you while you're still here. Um, what I mentioned before is that maybe there are some aspects that uh, I would like you to maybe address. Um, one for sure is in terms of budgets. Uh, what are the like the the most common mistakes? Uh, what is, uh, for example, the things that I always question as an applicant is like the distribution and ratio between the different cost categories, uh, the other resources, um, uh, and also because uh, your um, the funds that um, you are representing today have a very different. Um, different policy on, for example, advanced payment and there's from zero advanced payment to 100% advanced payment. Uh, so this is maybe some of the, some of the um, aspects of budgets. Also in terms of timelines, is it like, uh, is there too much events uh, in a too short uh, period of time? Or is it, you know, should we, if we have, uh, um, the call says the minimum and maximum length of the project, should we go for the minimum, for the maximum, or it's totally coming from the content and the number of partners? 
And uh, the third aspect, maybe, I know it's a lot, <laughs> uh, and the third also the partnerships, because we mentioned before that it can be an added value, but it can also be a disaster if it's with unknown organizations or uh, poorly managed. Um, so just as some key points, but of course, maybe those that come, come um, on your mind the first one when we uh, talk about flops that you most often see or have experienced, uh, experienced as applicants yourself. I can start again because I can connect it also to what uh, they said at the end. This um, skepticism she shared, are we in a paradigm shift already and how we imagine the, 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 the future and how she's skeptical about how uh, these new ideas could take root or kind of like uh, be realized or are actually realized or not in the region, which I totally uh, understand. Uh, the reason how, uh, why, why it's for me a practical question, if you had uh, for the Culture of Solidarity Fund an idea to build pan-European alliances to make, for example, exactly sure that such ideas are not only happening in Northern Europe or in Western Europe, but exactly where it's much more difficult uh, uh, by, and, and exactly where you need strong backup from elsewhere in Europe, then that would be typically a project concept that could uh, feature very well under the culture of solidarity fund because this is what it's all about. What it's all about, you know, it's not about uh, finding local solutions and then again, like Western Europe does something, Northern Europe does something, and uh, Southern Europe is and Southeastern Europe is kind of like struggling uh, through. No, uh, our foundation since the very beginning and the culture of solidarity fund even more is exactly of being better. Uh, in anything we do as Europeans together. And this is maybe the most practical uh, and, and ideological answer I can give what mm -hmm. uh, is in all these uh, uh, projects um, that, uh, or that what, what we look for in this culture of solidarity fund. Join forces with others to imagine and dream of what you want to do uh, uh, at home. And it can be very, it makes you locally stronger through going on European level. Maybe that's that's in, in very general. Now for the practical questions, because I can also be very short in that, because there are no uh, restrictions of whatsoever kind in the culture of solidarity fund, except this uh, three small, medium, uh, large scale uh, uh, levels of funds we give, which is more like uh, for structuring the incoming uh, uh, requests. Uh, when it comes to budget, I see, I mean, or maybe that's also specific, specificity about the European Cultural Foundation, because we are in our programs uh, and in how we work a lot in touch uh, with the field. So, and we work with many people in the field and also the people who read the proposals are, is ourselves and people who are in the field. So we actually know what people submit and whether it's realistic or not. So what I see a lot is, you know, like anything is possible. You can ask for 100% uh, salary costs for the next uh, month um, or, or, or do something, I don't know, in, in, uh, in three years from now, as long as, it's, 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 as it's, it's realistic and feasible and logic why you do it. So, you know, I see a lot of uh, budgets coming in that are, um, you look at it as somebody who has experience in the field and you see that they're hiding something you know don't hide but explain mm -hmm. why you want to do it it's totally fine if you say my organization does that and that and that's why for the next five months we need a, a salary cost but the argumentation has to be credible and convincing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if it's just uh, you know like there's a lot of talk about project idea and 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 and, and concepts and da -di -da -di -da, and then in the budget you see just uh, salary costs for five uh, people and you don't know why, uh, or travel costs for travel that is not uh, likely to happen because nobody's traveling now, or uh, big events are not even allowed uh, 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 by the authorities, or nobody knows how and under which uh, circumstances they will be allowed, then you know you don't stand a chance. So it's really that realistic, that present just genuinely realistically an and, 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 and argument what you want to do. Be honest, and then. <laughs> be honest, exactly. We, we, we are experienced enough to, to see and usually know. Um, see, true, true life. Exactly. <laughs> and budgets are always very telling. You know, you can say a lot in words at the end and figures. It's always, but you know uh, that. Or as 
experienced <laughs> grant writers and uh, grant makers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michal, Veronica, Veronica, please. So. <laughs> yeah, um, I totally agree. Basically, you, well, we are the same. We also don't have any limitations in the budget except for the for the equipment and renovation. But you know, that's even that is pretty high. It's fifty percent of the of the total amount. So, but whenever I well, for me, the budget only tells a story if I see it together with the with the application, because that's the only way you can actually read the budget. You could only have like cost for the salaries or you can only have the cost for external co-workers but it all depends on what the project is all about and how you want to do it and um so so you cannot just say one way or the other because it all depends on what you want to do and how you want to do it mm -hmm. um so i wouldn't say you know this is okay and if you have 30 percent of the of the budget for for the stuff and then the others for for other costs it, sometimes it makes sense, but then on other times it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, maybe from our side, even as a fund operator and also as CNVOS, uh, we are definitely more inclined for the projects or, or, or for organizations to put more money into their stuff and to employees or, you know, just the, the, the people who with whom they work on the long term, just because that means that the organization will benefit from the implementation of the project as well. If you outsource them everything, then a year after that or two years after the project, the organization will be in the same level as it was before. But if you, if you invest also in people, that means that the organization will have better knowledge and uh, will, will get something from them. But that's, that's a special thing also because a part of our project is dedicated to the capacity building of the organization. And that's a very strong component of our project mm -hmm. and of, of the program in, in, in total. So this for us is important information as well, but it's not, it's not a precondition. If the organization doesn't have any employees, then of course it, they will they will find other solution, and that that's fine as well. Um, as for the common mistakes, I was actually surprised to see that we did have quite some applications that were declined on the on the first review because they were um, they went over the ninety percent of the co finding and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. you know this. Um, these very basic technical mistakes, mistakes in, in a way yeah that doesn't make any sense <laughs> and okay. for me it's horrible whenever that happens because that means that nobody even look at the application as, a, as an application we have no idea what these projects are about because we had to reject them at the beginning mm -hmm. um okay so there's, i, I yeah. see that there's they a have question some for questions yeah yeah, um, micro projects. So the, sm the micro projects, we still have funds. Yes, and applications are still possible. So please um, send us the applications. But please keep in mind that this is really something that has to be uh, addressed urgently. So it means that it is something that is going on now, and we have um, different ones. So the other one in the context of outputs. I think this is a more uh, like a question for everyone. So maybe we yeah. give you a few moments to condense the, the magic answer in one sentence while we have, we give the opportunity to Michal yes. um, to, to answer the question. And I, was, I would like to ask you, Michal, there is something that I've noticed in your documentation that I haven't seen uh, before. It is the reconfirmation of partners and that the partners have to reconfirm their participation in the project and that at least 75% of partners have to confirm in order that the, the contract is actually signed. Um, maybe if you could also include that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I will be very brief because I will have to go as well very soon. Uh, to answer your practical questions, first of all, yes, we can... Uh, um, support 100% of the project costs. We give 80% of the grant uh, upfront. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, everything is documented by invoices um, and in the final report 
starting stage, uh, you can spend 15% of the grant for the overhead costs, so-called, so for the internal expenses, for utilities, for the bills, for the rent of the uh, um, premises of the organization. But you cannot spend the grant for the uh, employment rule so by the labor code. Um, but we pay the expert fees um, if you have some experts or artists involved in your projects. Uh, as for the question, the tough question uh, that I see in the chat, we as a government funded organization, we see that the highest demand comes from the uh, culture sector or the art sector. It definitely makes the largest portion of our applications and so also the support uh, that we distribute also goes mostly to the area of cultural projects. So we realize that uh, culture is important because people uh, demonstrate it by their ideas and especially in the area of international cooperation or regional cooperation where uh, we talk about achieving some level of cohesion, some level of mutual understanding uh, and um, more awareness of culture diversity or diversity in general. It is the culture and it is the arts uh, a project that uh, um, matter the most or can address these aims uh, in the best way. Mm -hmm. So I think any funder that um, is aiming at this area is realizing uh, that we should continue our support to culture and arts. Uh, that would be maybe enough from my side. I have mm -hmm. to leave, as I said, thank you very much once okay. again for this opportunity. And if I just may maybe draw the attention of everyone who stayed with us, the Vishigat Fund is celebrating the 20th anniversary this month. And we have a um, um, new website dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 20vishigatfund.com. Um, we just have some uh, um, of our projects featured there. So if you are interested, you can uh, listen to our grantees, um, what they achieved with the Visegrad grants. Uh, 20visegradfunds.com, I will actually write it. Okay. Um, and with this, okay. I would like Perfect. to say Thank you. bye to everyone. Thank you for the attention. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Bye bye. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's a. Uh -huh. Philip is has the solution. <laughs> Philip has the solution. The Answering the tough question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I think it's a bit easier for me to answer because we don't look necessarily for outputs. You know, that's maybe also in, in, in context to what I said before. We are not the European Union. We are not Creative Europe. We are not the Visegrad Fund. We don't mm -hmm. have that pressure to... To, 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 to show all these uh, things uh, that are so uh, common in many other uh, programs. Um, it's just, and especially addressing this question the uh, guest asked, uh, it's just, it has to be, again, similar to the budget, it has to be convincing. You know, it's mm -hmm. many, many uh, project proposals then like, uh, we want to explore that and that and that question that's not going to be enough, uh, but you don't have to have any outputs uh, as long as you convince us about the process you want to start or launch or thinking process or you want to develop something for a thinking process uh, that comes to terms with what's going on uh, uh, later on. As long as it's that convincing, it doesn't have to be immediately an, 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 an output. It can also be, uh, or mostly it's maybe starting up something new or starting up something to survive. Mm -hmm. Most of the projects, uh, grants we made uh, are small ones, up to 5,000. You know, you, we, we don't expect you to, to have fantastic uh, outputs, yeah. but maybe to give an impulse to something mm -hmm. or, or, or to also because we are so small ourselves, you know, that it's, it's more like kicking off things and more a ripple out effect, uh, joining forces with others, maybe joining forces even developing an idea that can go to a, a, indeed to a creative Europe application in the future to the Norwegian fund to the Visegrad mm -hmm. fund later on and then you can you know uh, but it's explicitly really for uh, developing things also mm -hmm. magic recipe from Veronica <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will um, try to be here um, well as precise as possible because we are one of those who actually demand the outputs and the outcomes and stuff like that but I think that it's um, those things 
are definitely possible in the cultural sector as well. But in, instead of, um, we, we are not the keen of people who would like to know how many people will see the show or how many participants you will get, but the switch that happens in the head of the people who come there. Or, you know, the, the switch in the attitude towards um, human rights or specific um, action or specific minority or specific vulnerable group or whatever the, that, that because somebody has seen your show or has attended your theater or, or whatever participated in your events has changed in, in their minds, in their perspectives, or maybe just, you know, they opened their mind. They started to think about something. So these are the kind of results that we are hoping for. And we know that this cannot happen for all the participants that came come to the, to the show or whatever. So we are aware that you cannot, change the world with one show but mm -hmm. it's a it's a process uh, but we are interested in this in this process as for um, i think that you're you're still the 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 question was more um to the government and to the to the society mm -hmm. in general i don't have the i don't have the answer but maybe you know some well maybe you the alternative um, campaigning can do and you know you just switch off culture like in total for one day that that might trigger the thing i don't know how the world would look like without it and uh, i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to say it but that sometimes you just have to show people directly what that means because they don't have it mm -hmm. in their mind yes i think maybe you already did, uh, did, did give us the the um the solution that uh, is also maybe the th the thought with which uh, i can finish this discussion um it's uh, maybe we have to just bring the decision makers to the event so that they uh, leave this switch in their heads so maybe that's the the the, the recipe the magic solution uh, i would really like to thank you for extending your um your time with us um there's a lot of things that we could still uh, talk about um, thank you for um, joining us and I would just like uh, um, to give word to Ines uh, to uh, wrap it up and um, tell us what follows in the next days. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Wuska. and uh, Thank you, Veronica, and thank you, Philip, for this extra time. Uh, so to wrap it up, uh, so it's really important to join forces, as you said to have a good argumentation, to put things into perspective, to read the guidelines. <laughs> As Veronica said, yes, some of you still don't read the guidelines. Uh, that was also the theme of our uh, previous seminar. So you're all invited to join us tomorrow as we were going to talk about uh, when you already read the guidelines and you have been successful, how to implement the project. Uh, so, um, See you all tomorrow and thank you again, Urska, Veronica and Philippe and all the participants. Bye. Bye.